Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. No real drama in this equity market, down just a little bit, off by a half of 1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue, the downgrades piling up. We downgraded our stand. Expect downgrades. Of course, the, the situation is quite challenging at the moment. Sentiment probably has you know, hit peak bearishness. Yes, we're squarely in a slowdown. We have all the components in place that would make that happen. There's a lot of tightening priced in. At some point, you know, demand is going to start to respond. Everybody's concerned about what the next 12 to 18 months will bring. Global growth will continue to slow. We have two problems, inflation and supply. It's a tale of, of two uh, halves. The second half of the year, does slow down considerably. We need to get into Q3, see what happens. Definitely a slower trajectory in the second half of the year. Joining us now to discuss, Judy Bill of Kane Anderson Rudnick, Mike Contopoulos of RB Advisors. Judy, I want to come to you. Typically, and forgive the sarcasm, the snark, when the OECD and the World Bank starts catching up, you're meant to start looking the other way. Judy, are we at that point yet? I don't think we're quite at that point yet because I don't think it's clear exactly how the consumer is turning out right now. It, it's just we, we need a little bit more time and a little bit more data. We have so many factors that are making it very hard to understand exactly where we are. We don't know where we are in terms of supply. It seems like we're going to be choking on a lot of inventory. We don't know exactly where we're going to end up on rates. And I think the employment picture is starting to get a little bit more complicated. We're hearing so much about layoffs in Silicon Valley. And the, the question is, will the frontline work continue to be strong? I think that's where we need to focus our attention. Michael, what's your take on this? I think, Jonathan, that, you know, the growth story still remains intact. Um, you know, we are seeing obvious signs of plateauing in, in some of the signals out there, but there's nothing suggestive of a near-term recession. The consumer's very healthy. PMI surprised to the upside. Um, you know, continuing jobless claims are, are very, very at a, at a very great point right now. Obviously, unemployment is, is incredibly low. I always... Um, you know, throughout my career, I've always learned that when you get the, the you know, reports of layoffs in the paper of individual companies, you're supposed to look the other way because, of course, everybody always, you know, reports on the layoffs. No one ever reports on the hiring. So I think we need to see a lot more data before we sit here and call it a massive slowdown in the economy. And in fact, as I've said before on the show, I think most likely uh, the economy can handle much higher rates than what's appreciated because the consumer is in such good shape. Uh, the transmission mechanism of higher rates to the real economy is not what it once was. Corporate balance sheets are strong. So, you know, we still think there's room for the economy to run. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, risk assets, uh, you know, outperform. But we do think the economy is in fine shape right now. Judy, let's talk about that consumer. I know what you're worried about. And you've said it. I've read your notes. The tsunami of inventory hitting just as the consumer weakens. Is that a problem for certain retailers or a problem for the whole of this market? Well, you know, in the U.S., the consumer drives a lot of the market, so it has implications for the rest of the economy, but for retail in particular, it's a really big problem. If Target, a company that's at large and usually quite adept at managing its inventory, is choking on its own inventory, and we still have a large backlog of ships in Asia coming towards us, that's going to hit right when there's the core back-to-school and holiday season, that's when retailers really make their money. So I think there's nothing but trouble ahead for retail right now. Julie, talk to me about that inventory story at the likes of Target, though. Did you see that as a sign of weakness or a sign of bad execution, bad management because of a shift in consumer preferences? I think it's both, right? I think when a lot of inventory is ordered, you have to think about it that six, nine months before it actually hits stores. So, you know, six to nine months ago, gas prices were very different than they were today. And you know we still had the underlying effects of stimulus and a lot of pent-up demand. I think numbers will actually look pretty good through this summer because the pent-up demand for travel is going to be a nice boost to the economy. But then I think when it's time for back to school and holiday, it's really going to get kind of ugly. There's an inflation story here as well, Michael. I'd love your input on it. And you've got the good side with some disinflationary forces here with this inventory build-up that. Judy speaking to. Then on the services side, you've still got that pent up demand. How do you think one offsets the other through the next several months through the rest of this year? 
We certainly still have the, the huge pent up demand on the services side, but you also have the war in, in Russia and Ukraine that's causing oil prices to spike, food inflation to, to remain high. I mean, you look at commodities, commodities still remain at an all time high in terms of uh, in terms of prices. So inflation is real. Inflation is alive. It's, it's not just one area of the economy that you need to pay attention to. You know, it's really very broad based. Wage growth is still strong. Housing prices are, are still very, very high, owner's equivalent rent. But then you also have the big secular issues, right? Deglobalization, um, an, an aging demographic that's actually drawing down on the global stock of savings and spending that into the real economy. That actually has an inflationary impulse. So I, I think inflation is here to stay. Um, you know, there's certainly reasons maybe to expect that we're near the highs. I wouldn't necessarily say we've peaked quite yet. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't. But I think there are lots of reasons from commodities to wages to rents to the sort of more secular factors to expect inflation uh, stays where it is. You might get a little bit of shifting of inflationary pressures from, from goods to services as well. But I think at the end of the day, it might be closer to a wash than most expect. 25 minutes out from the open and bow. Futures down about a half of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down a half of 1% also. Yesterday, the World Bank cutting its growth outlook to 2.9%. This morning, the OECD joining in, looking for a three-handle just and just about 3% is their outlook. Katie Lines, a big cut to the outlook from them. A big cut, one and a half percentage points at a global level. And when you look, there actually were some larger cuts for individual countries themselves. For example, the U.S. cut down to two and a half percent growth for this year for the euro area, cut down to 2.6%. And China, they say, is going to grow only 4.4%, which of course is well below Beijing's own target. Now, the organization is basically saying that the world economy is going to pay a very hefty price for the war in Ukraine. Ukraine for supply chain issues and, of course, stronger inflation. And that is the other part of this, John. It's not just about growth outlook cuts. It's about inflation outlook hikes. The OECD doubling its inflation projection for its 38 member countries to nearly 9% this year. And of course, a large part of that driven by spiking commodity prices, oil front and center in that with Brent up 56% just year to date. And of course, compounding, exacerbating that problem, the dollar hovering around 20 year highs, creating a huge problem for everyone trying to buy dollar denominated goods. Oil, of course, is among them. When you put it all together, you've got hotter inflation and cooler growth and a dilemma for central bankers who want to tame prices, but also want to keep the landing soft. And looking at the bond market, you can see some concern around that in that, yes, the 2 tens curve is no longer inverted, but still it's only in between 20 and 30 basis points, uh, depending on the day. That is a reflection of the fear that if there's too much aggression now, it means a recession later. And we actually heard Ray Dalio out overnight in an Australian newspaper talking about stagflation, saying that, yes, now it's central banks hiking and tightening, but in 2024, it's going to be a story of easing and cutting because of that stagflation. John. 2024 is not that far away. It Kelly is. Lines, thank you. And this leaves the consumer trapped, getting squeezed. We've all seen it, haven't we, on the online shop and you have the option, you're confronted with it. Buy now, pay later. Well, those buy now, pay later lenders are starting to feel the pain. The loan packages behind them are dropping in value. With new competition adding to the pressure as well, Shanali, we had to catch up this morning. What is going on, not just with a firm, but across this industry? It's a great question because a firm is still down pre-market today. As you've seen, it dropped more than 75% already this year. Compare that with a PayPal, a little more diversified, but also doubling down on buy now, pay later, more than 50% decline this year. I'd love to tell you, John, that this is all about Apple, but you hit the nail on the head there. A lot of this is also the cost of financing. The securitization market hitting some pressure there and of course that is going to impact a company like a firm that funds about a third of its loans through securitized lending but there's also this broader push on Wall Street for example Wedbush initiating a firm at an underperform saying that they might get a better cost of financing by getting a bank charter you've seen also even bigger firms like Goldman Sachs pushing into consumer lending to lower that cost of funding the question is is a bank charter worth it for a firm like a firm you had Jamie Dimon Jack a couple of months ago talking about how a firm started as a hot buy now pay later company and then also expanding now into different products like deposits and the question here is now is that enough to get it through uh, this very difficult cycle will there be a washout in this space as we see job cuts starting to matter at other companies. Shanali I imagine this is not going to be the last time we talk about this this year. Shanali Basak there our Wall Street correspondent. Julie Beal I know you've got things to say so here's your chance. What are your thoughts on what's happening here? whole wash of buy now, pay later is an interesting 
an interesting business because you think about it, right? None of these businesses have been back tested in a recession, right? And they're securitized against things like sweaters. So how on earth should we expect these businesses to perform when customers suddenly can't pay, right? I think they're going to pay their utilities before they're going to pay for their sweater. Um, so I, I think obviously as, as a long-term investor, we've never really been interested in these stocks, but I think there's a more core problem with these businesses, right? And that they're targeting young people and young people are suddenly being told, okay, you can buy now, pay later on your sweater. Your student loans might be forgiven. Please come onto Robinhood and trade on margin. I'm really worried about the financial health of the younger generation of consumers and the moral hazard that can be involved in that. So, you know, for us, I think it's a concern because I think it would take years for the to repair some of the financial damages that have been done as many of these younger consumers have been overextended. And there's not a lot of financial education to really support them either. So I, we're definitely very concerned and obviously not buyers of the firm. Julie, it's a really legitimate concern. I'll give you another one in the market, market specific. Have we got a clean read on which companies this trend has been supporting? Because if this starts to break down, how much of the earnings of certain companies do we need to start to reassess? Yeah, I think then we're back on retail, right? You know, it's it's so many of these retailers jumped onto the buy now, pay later because look, it's a great opportunity for them to increase their basket size. And I think, you know, they, the economics of that business start to look really, really poor if suddenly there's levels of defaults. And I mean, I've been shocked to see how quickly, you know, the a firm loan book starts to look really poor and that's at very high levels of employment and strong wage growth and still people aren't paying for their sweaters. Mike, they're not going to pay for their sweaters. That's probably not a systemic risk. What might be is something more broader. Mike, I'm often thinking about where is the leverage, where is the leverage? And I'm confronted by guest after guest who tells me consumer balance sheets, household balance sheets, they're strong. Corporate balance sheets, they're strong. If you think, Mike, where's the leverage right now? Where do you think it is? You know, I think there's a... Uh the leverage is likely into the uh, you know the, the 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 far sort of outer reaches of the private debt market more than anything else, right? If you think about what happened over the last 12 years, not just since COVID, but going all the way back to the global financial crisis, easy monetary policy, zero interest rate pop, you know, zero interest rates globally, at 1.27 percent of all fixed income assets uh, having a negative yield generally low growth up until the post-COVID years. All of that incentivized a tremendous amount of risk-taking, tremendous amount of re-leveraging on the private side of the economy, the shadow banking side of the economy. And so I think that's probably where the leverage is hidden, um, more so than in public uh, public companies and even on the consumer side. You know, that's, that's where we are. Mike Contopoulos, Julie Beale, sticking with us. Futures lower by a half of 1% with some movers. Here's Abby. John, well, one of the top sectors on the year outperforming the consumer staple space, and we have a example of why. Today we have the shares of Campbell Soup popping higher this on a much better a quarter than expected. The stock up more than 2%. They beat. And it's interesting because higher prices lifted their sales. C prices that uh, consumers are paying for the likes of goldfish, their soups. Interestingly, organic sales were up even more, up 9%. Sales guidance was strong, and the company said that they expect demand to remain strong. So here's a place where consumers are really absorbing higher costs. Novavax up 8.3%. Their COVID shot has gotten the backing from the FDA advisory panel. A bit of a different delivery mechanism. Some have said that it could be very good for the booster. So those shares up 8.5%. To the downside, not by a huge amount, but we have meta platforms down half a percent. The reason we're talking about it, John, this is the last day it will trade under the Facebook, the FB ticker. Tomorrow it will be under the meta ticker. And then finally, Carnival down 2.4%. Morgan Stanley has turned a little bit chilly on the cruise line companies cutting price targets across the board saying that there are weak channel checks growing macro risks and rising debt costs and carnival is maintained at an underweight john abby thank you i will continue to call it facebook because i still call alphabet google too abby thank you very much 496 496 is the average price for a gallon of gas in america right now and the biden administration knows it's got a problem Bringing inflation down should be our number one priority, and President Biden has indicated that it is our top priority. That conversation, up next.
But we're not going to give up on the congressional agenda. We absolutely can't do that. When families are facing uh, 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 exacerbated uh, costs in prescription drugs and health care and education and housing, uh, we're going to do everything we can to get Congress on board in helping the American people to face this inflationary challenge. They talk about it just as much as we do. They need to pony up on the policy side uh, the same way we're doing. The White House confronting a problem. Gas and diesel prices jump into the highest on record with the midterms just around the corner. This as the latest polls show waning approval of the president's handling of surging prices. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew joins us now for more. Morning, Joe. Good morning. It's interesting to hear the messaging come from this White House, Jonathan. It's it's morphed over time here. It's become more deliberate as the White House tries to draw a distinction between what it can do what Congress can do, and then, of course, what the Fed is able to do. You heard Jared uh, Bernstein talking there on the lawn of the White House yesterday with ideas here that the, the administration is hoping Congress will be able to pass what we like to call the Bipartisan Innovation Act. This is the big piece of legislation that includes the CHIP Act. That's going to continue here. It's been stuck in Congress, Jonathan, for the better part of a year. The administration also trying to revive ideas from Build Back Better, things like ideas to uh, programs to lower drug prices, maybe to expand the child tax credit. And there is an expectation that the White House will go for, Democrats will go for reconciliation to try to do that alone on just Democratic votes. But you heard Janet Yellen talking there yesterday. All of these ideas come with a caveat as well, or a reminder is a better uh, word to use, that this is a global phenomenon and shocks from the war in Ukraine and, of course, COVID have brought us this far. But, of course, Jonathan, we know that we were talking about high gas prices, high oil prices, and inflation across the board before Vladimir Putin ever invaded Ukraine. In a big way as well. Joe Matthew, thank you, sir. As always, some of the numbers in the future. We talked about the gas price forecast from J.P. Morgan. They say that this summer could get crueler. Their words, we could end up at $6.00 for your average gallon of gas in America. On crude per barrel, 140, the forecast now from Goldman for the third quarter. And they think we could be stuck with that kind of number out 12 months. They're looking at the second quarter of 2023 at 130. Judy Bill, you've noticed something interesting about the correction we've seen. That what's worked is low quality commodity companies and that's not normal. Can you walk me through your observation and why you might be leaning in a different direction? Right. I, I think it's been kind of an atypical correction where, you know, normally when people are concerned about a slowdown, there's a flight to quality businesses, ones that have really durable earnings that can do well, even in a difficult macro. But because this is an inflationary environment, they've actually moved towards commodity markets. For us at our firm, where our average time horizon is five years, I'm a little uncomfortable loading up on commodity costs when it's really tied to, you know, Putin's midlife crisis. That doesn't sound like a great place for me to be putting all our money in. So we're more focused on those quality businesses, which are actually kind of on sale right now. Um, you see them in some of the software names, but a name like market access and financials. You know, these are businesses that have a lot of earnings uh, consistency, and that's what really gets rewarded when we are in a more uncertain macroeconomic environment. I think a lot of people calling the commodity market need a therapist much of the time. Forecasting crew is really, really difficult. Mike Contopoulos, can you make a call, though, that we've seen the high on Treasury yields without seeing a high on crude? Well, I think that uh, we likely have not seen the high uh, in Treasury yields. And, uh, you know, it can be independent of what's happening in, in crude, quite frank, frankly. You know, when you look at the, the government debt, there are four main factors to drive, to drive Treasury yields. You have uh, inflation, which clearly oil is going to have an impact on. But you have economic growth, you have the size of the Fed balance sheet, and you have the federal funds rate. And we know all four of those factors are suggestive of higher, not lower yields. And I actually think that over the next several months, QT in the process of, of uh, no longer reinvesting the matured principle of the Treasury holdings of the, the Fed's portfolio could cause some indigestion in the 10 years. So I think regardless of what happens with oil and inflation, uh, you likely haven't seen the highs on the 10 year this cycle. Uh, and that, you know, you might reach there in the next one, three, six months. Let's talk about that then, Mike, because I know where you stand on the front end of the curve. Your view on the Fed is that this economy is resilient. It can take a whole lot more. They've got more work to do. I get that. Yields up at the front end. What kind of numbers do you think this 10-year could challenge? 320, the high of early May. Where do you think this is going? Yeah, I see no reason why the 10-year couldn't get to, to 350 uh, at least. And then, of course, if you whistle by the graveyard and you don't go into recession at some point in, in 2023 or beyond, you certainly could go higher than that. But, but for me and for RBA, I think 
It's more about the secular shift of, of rates and inflation. You know, for 40 years, you had lower lows and lower highs as you step down with each economic cycle. And more likely than not, what you're going to have going forward are higher highs and higher lows on yields. And so, of course, during the next recession, yields will fall, inflation will fall. But coming out of that recession, they likely go higher than, than the previous uh, previous period. And so for, for the current economic cycle that we are uh, we're in, maybe it's 350, maybe it's 375. Um, you know, it's, it's, it'll be hard pressed to get to four, I think. But, you know, again, if this cycle has another two, three years from now uh, to, to run, then, then you certainly could. So I don't think 320 or 317 is, is the high on the 10 year. I would expect, you know, 325, 350 as the next, uh, the next level to be looking towards. Mike, just quickly, I think you've touched on the heart of the problem for a lot of people. Still now, there's a view that a lot of this is temporary, painful, but temporary, and that this can't persist, it will fall on its own weight. You're pushing back against that, aren't you? You think the dynamics we're experiencing now can persist for a whole lot longer than people think? I, we truly believe that the the forty year and in, in the forty year bull market in Treasuries is dead. You know, died two years ago. We hit fifty basis points on the ten year, August fourth of of twenty twenty. It's been a pretty steady rise up. You know, Chair Yellen, I'll still call her Chair Yellen. She, uh, you know, she really disappointed uh, a couple times in the last few weeks. You know, she didn't mention the biggest driver of inflation, which is all the QE dating back to the global financial crisis, then layering more QE during COVID, plus all the fiscal stimulus. I mean, that's very similar to what we saw in the 1960s around the amount of monetary stimulus used to fund the Vietnam War, and then coupled with oil embargoes of the 1970s. That's exactly what's going on now. And she didn't even mention it. She wants to blame Putin and, and Russia and Ukraine and, and supply chain constraints. And they still have this mentality that things are transitory. Well, if you believe that, you know, going back to, to the crisis, this yeah. was a problem that started then, then, hey, it's going to be around for a while. Mike Contopoulos, Julie Beale, to the both of you, thank you. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Exxon, $100. That conversation coming up next. From New York, let's get straight to your morning calls. Bank of America downgrading Target to neutral, highlighting competitive pricing and weaker margins. Morgan Stanley downgrading Ultra to underweight, expecting higher gas prices to pressure consumers. And finally, BMO naming Amazon its top pick within the mega caps, expecting shares to rally in the second half. Coming up, JP Morgan's David Stubbs. Your opening bell is up next. Four seconds away from the up and in New York City this morning. Good morning. Futures lower, just a little bit. Negative by four tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down a third of one percent. On the Russell, squeeze that in, down about a half of one percent. From New York, there's your opening bell. Switch at the board and get to the bond market. Yields look a little something like this. Higher by three basis points to three percent on a ten-year. Getting comfortable with a three handle on a 10-year the last couple of days. Euro dollar 10737, positive a third of 1%, going into the ECB tomorrow. And crude, finally a break of 120. 120, 23, up 7 tenths of 1%. That's across asset price action, about 15 seconds in. Here are your movers. Here's Abby. John, let's take a look at one big laggard this morning, and that, of course, is Intel. Shares have been cut at City after the management is basically talking down the quarterly outlook. We've had so many companies recently pre-announcing to the downside. Intel doing it in a softer way. That that chip stock down 3.5%. Western Digital, on the other hand, up 4.2% as they are considering a breakup uh, on pressure from uh, Elliott. They would basically divide their business into two companies, the flash memory and then the disk drives. Roku up 5.1% as the insider sell window has closed. So essentially employees cannot sell shares. More at stake. Analysts like this move quite a bit. And then Alibaba up for a third day, up about 4% as China has approved more games. Uh, so we've seen this big rebound. There's a debate now whether or not this is a, a viable bottom here for China tech. The contrarian, however, John, who uh, a while ago said that the technology China tech would uh, keep selling or would sell off, and it certainly did down more than 50% at the lows. He says this is not a viable bottom. But that today, is a top pick, though, for Marko Kalanovic over at JP Morgan. Abby, thank you. A top pick. China ADRs for him.
Big tech right now, where are we? Information technology, middle of the pack, down about six tenths of 1%. Energy, top of the pile, relatively speaking, up by 0.05%. Overall, the S&P 500 down about five or six tenths of 1%. Crude up in a big way this year, you know that already. Energy equities as well, up 60%. Percent more than that this year alone. Taylor Riggs has more. Hi, Taylor. John, briefly yesterday hitting 120 on crude, and that trend continues today now, trying to hover near that 120 or so dollar a barrel. And so, really, the story of the year has always been about the energy sector. The themes for the days continue, really, is the theme for the years. You highlighted that sector. I think what is crazy, and you mentioned some of these statistics in the introduction. Crude is up 125 percent. So when I take a look at the S&P 500 and you're taking a look at the best performers in the energy sector up 65 percent, that blows you away until you realize that that gain is half of what the actual energy uh, crude really has gained here at more than 120 percent. So typically if we think about correlations, Maybe one would expect a little bit more of a better performance here for some of the energy stocks when you think about the actual performance of energy. I think what is so interesting, though, is you're actually getting some intro, um, some of the intraday stocks here hitting record highs. I think you had Valero yesterday, another price target increase. Exxon Mobil was at another record high yesterday. And so some of the individual stocks are actually doing really, really well underneath the sector surface, though, even though perhaps maybe the energy sector only up 65 percent with the huge gains in crew that you've seen. And Say they're very disciplined, seemingly no interest in building out capacity. Nope. It is all about cash flow, returning um, money to shareholders. That has been the theme of John, the decade, maybe, and that certainly has been continuing this year. Taylor Riggs, thank you. Thank you very much. Just one sector to keep an eye on, of course, through the year. Kelly Lyons, it has been very different over the last couple of years compared to the previous decade. Yeah, growth has dominated for so, so long, John, and we've seen a couple of false starts, head fakes, where we see a period of value outperforming dramatically. It never really seems to last. The question is, is this time different? Because once again, this year we are seeing value outperforming as we have the specter of higher rates, which puts pressure on higher multiple, higher growth companies. We actually have the S&P value index only down about 4% this year. Its growth counterpart is down down 21%. So that puts value on pace for the widest margin on an annual basis of outperformance relative to growth in any year since 2000. And value has now actually regained all of its losses relative to growth since the pandemic began. Now, of course, that's reflected on a sector level. Taylor was just running through how energy is far and away the outperformer. Note what is the underperformer. The three worst sectors in the S&P 500 discretionary communications and tech, all of which are, of course, tech heavy. So growth stocks are obviously dominated by those tech plays, and we have seen those tech earnings projections slashed. We had Microsoft last week cutting its estimates, talking about FX headwinds. We've seen a number of companies from Meta to Tesla maybe uh, freezing, hiring, and overall Bloomberg Intelligence Intelligence says that since mid-April, growth stocks earnings estimates have slid by seven percentage points for the second quarter. They've been cut uh, for the second half, too. Meanwhile, values estimates for earnings have gone higher. The one thing I will say, though, when we're talking fundamentals, John, valuations for growth companies were around 30 about two years ago, now down at 21 for a forward P.E. multiple. So, yes, these stocks are still relatively more expensive, but they've gotten a whole lot cheaper, John. And Kelly Lines, thank you. How's this for a story? Some reports from a Swiss finance blog that State Street could make a Swiss franc, nine Swiss franc share bid for Credit Suisse. So that means we were down and down hard over at Credit Suisse, and we've erased much of that loss following that report. Taylor Reese, let's catch up on this one. What do you see? What have we heard this morning? And what do you make of the latest development? Yeah, John, so this is interesting because we were going to be coming on and talking about Credit Suisse and potential job cuts. And this is sort of an interesting story when you think about all of the uh, sort of um, cost cutting and, and job cutting sort of um, it, uh, conversations that we've had really throughout the industry. We've talked about retail being one of those. And then, of course, Credit Suisse warning about a third straight quarterly loss and potentially then uh, getting some job cuts and maybe trying to blame some monetary policy. Policy, but analysts saying that a lot of this was self-inflicted wounds. And then, of course, a lot of those losses, as you just mentioned, being erased, trying to turn positive now on a potential bid. So I think we're going to dive deeper into this, but really interesting on the heels of sort of the announcement this morning of looking at perhaps maybe some more cost-cutting measures, trying to make perhaps some more attractiveness, some more value generation underway, John. And Taylor, thank you. Let's catch up on that again in about five or ten minutes, just to repeat. The report comes from a Swiss finance blog called Inside Parade, citing a single insider, just to give you an idea of what's behind this report. Bloomberg has reached out, of course, to State Street for comment. We haven't requested, we've received, we haven't received that comment so far. We've reached out to Credit Suisse, of course, for comment. They declined to comment when contacted by the team here at Bloomberg News. So the report 
citing a single insider from a Swiss finance blog called Inside Parade, saying that State Street could make a nine Swiss franc share bid for Credit Suisse and that that bid, that offer could come as soon as the coming days. So we were down hard on that name and now we're down just 1%. We'll continue that conversation in just a moment. But a broader equity market, we are down about a half of 1% on the S&P 500 and we've seen many cuts to the outlook. Here's the latest from David Stubbs over at JP Morgan Private Bank, 42.50 down from 4,500. Goes on to say a good chunk of the recent decline in stock prices is attributable to a marked drop in distant earnings. As a result, we revise our year-end 22 S&P 500 outlook to 42.50. David, great to catch up, sir. Good friend of the show, good friend of mine. Let's work through it. 42.50, why? Basically, no gains for the rest of the year. Well, sure. Good to see you, John. Uh, in discussions with our equity team, you know, about the outlook. I think we see some uh, margin compression ahead, for sure. We absolutely owe in the count that the growth is going to slow. Our economics team, uh, you're pointing to uh, sub 2% growth next year for the US economy. You put those two things together, um, as well as some, you know, you know, some question marks over how, uh, how high the Fed can go in their uh, policy tightening. And you get to, uh, as you say, a, a rather modest outlook for us. I think the, the point on the longer term you know, earnings one is, is a very interesting one. As we've seen, you know, next 12 months earnings have continued to grind higher you know, over this, this year. And the, and the equity team are absolutely pointing to uh, you know, sectors such as healthcare that have that resilience uh, over, you know, over the earnings uh, pattern. But if you look further out, estimates of three to five years gro growth, which are present in the, in the market, uh, have come in quite a bit. And that, firstly, you know, for us, re reflects a little bit of a correction after huge optimism built up post-pandemic about you know, some of these digital uh, trends. Uh, but, but most of that now seems to have, ha have, have actually happened. And we've seen uh, now that no reason why you can't have you know, uh, you know, good productivity growth for this cycle, no reason why uh, the, the long-run trajectory of America has changed. So I think that's an important you know, uh, aspect to this uh, decline we've seen in growth stocks this year. So, David, last time we spoke, you said a softish landing is still the base case for you, and people will be struggling to pair, reconcile that view with this view of limited upside on the S&P 500. How do you pair the market view with the economic view? You touched on it there, David. Just build on that a little bit more. Sure. Yeah, John, very simple. If nominal GDP is going to slow from its torrid pace uh, in the last few quarters, and yet things like the labor market wage growth are still going to be reasonably robust, you get uh, a compression of margins. And that's why you can have absolutely uh, economic growth next year of below trend. Let's be clear, like the, the, we're, we're calling for, I think, 1.4% growth next year that's below trend for the US economy, um, well, whilst having a pretty muted earnings upside from here. And we will need, I think, to see a clear turn in optimism about you know, corporate earnings, clear signs that the Fed uh, that won't have to go, say, above 3%, clear signs that uh, margins you know, reach a bottom before the equity market will rally sustainably. Now, look, in that time, John, you're going to have tradable rallies. And if you're watching this program and you're a trader, I'm sure um, you, can, you can absolutely make hay in those. But before your know, long-run investors really find a bottom, I think they need to see a few of those, a few of those things together. So uh, if, you put a, uh, if you put a weak GDP number on earnings, on earnings growth, it really happens to be not the most exciting outlook for, for equities on a, on a market-wide level, but certainly some opportunities now for traders and indeed for some long-run investors. And on the other side, in fixed income, in bonds, David, are you more comfortable, comforted, confident in this idea there's more upside in treasuries than perhaps there is in equities, that we can get a decent rally here in treasuries now, that this is the place to be again, that bonds are back? Can you say that? Absolutely, John. We're, we've been saying that for a few weeks now, having a lot of a, a lot of conviction that when the 10-year is north of 3%, it's time to add, especially if you're holding a, lo a lot of cash. I think this represents an important evolution in the market side, you know, drivers. The last you know, three to four to uh, five months, we've seen bonds be the issue. They were the ones uh, selling off, you know, raising the, uh, you know, the discount rate, hurting the equity multiple. You know, we've, we're probably at uh, you know, peak hawkishness right now. We think that the, the correlation has started to flip. The bonds can you know, uh, protect again. And so we, we are adv advising adding to duration when you can get more than 3% on, on a US 10-year. Uh, don't get me wrong. It, it, certainly, further losses would be possible if the inflation you know, proves a bit stickier. And you know, uh, Friday's CPI report, absolutely crucial there. If you get more hawkishness around the world, the ECB tomorrow, for example. So it's obviously not a one-way trade, but we think there's an asymmetry here 
that if you are looking for a severe sl a slowdown in growth next year, bonds are going to help protect your portfolio in a way that they haven't in the last you know, five to six months. So that's an important evolution now. Now the focus is on how deep will the, the economic slowdown be, how you know, uh, deep will the margin compression be. We're, we're obviously pretty cautious on those, those fronts, and that's why we're, we're advocating clients that don't have a lot of duration in their, in their portfolios to start to add. Bonds are back, according to David Stubbs. David, stick with us. I want to talk to you about the ECB in just a moment. Coming up on the programme, we'll do that and State Street potentially making a bid, maybe later this week, according to a report for Credit Suisse. That's next. about the banking sector in general, you know, rates, higher rates should help them, depending on the business model of the banks, but in general, it should help them in enhancing their net interest income. Of course, it's the other side of the coin, as we increase rates, that some of the borrowers may have more difficulties uh, confronting their, their obligations. The focus on the European banks, a bit of news from Credit Suisse earlier this morning, a bit of news again in the last 10 minutes with the latest. Here's Taylor Riggs. John, I want to be careful here, of course, as we're citing the Swiss finance blog. State Street may be, according to this report, offering to make nine Swiss franc a share bid for Credit Suisse here. Now, when I'm taking a look at some of the Swiss franc shares here, I have about 680 or so. So hugely negative. And then, as you can see there, a spike higher trying to gain here on the day on that report. I think what's interesting is before this and before sort of that big move upwards, the story really has been about a bank and a turnaround situation, warning again about another loss and really then looking at cost cutting and job costs and something that, John, that we've heard really sort of globally and in multiple other sectors and maybe sort of now hitting this sector as well. I think sort of another interesting story behind this is they're citing uh, monetary policy, significant tightening that's underway. And I know that you're going to talk about the ECB and yet Citigroup coming out and saying that, well, a lot of this could be self-inflicted. So again, sort of the big news this morning was really coming into this story, the big job cuts, a turnaround, another loss for the bank. And then, of course, a big move higher here on a Swiss finance blog report that nine francs per share could be bid from State Street for Credit Suisse. According to a single insider of that finance blog and of course we're waiting for some confirmation from either party here at Bloomberg. We'll keep you on top of our reporting. That's some of their reporting out of Switzerland at the moment. Taylor Reese, thank you. Brilliant work this morning as always. Looking forward to the close a little bit later. That is the story for Credit Suisse. Here's the story for the ECB. Matt Miller, we might see something in the next few months that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Yeah, and I think the key phrase there is in the next few months. Um, the sloth is unbelievable. I was just looking at the rates um, John, and the last time they were positive, uh, Barack Obama didn't have any gray hair. He was in his first term. Um, the hit song was Call Me Maybe by Carly Rae Jepsen. Tesla hadn't yet delivered its first Model S, and my friend Kriti Gupta was celebrating her quinceanera. So it was a long time ago. Um, this is the inflation picture right now at an all-time high. That is, of course, since they started measuring um, the entire euro area inflation. But still, 8.1%. It's a huge concern. The core in blue there at almost 4% um, is a real concern as well for the central bank, especially for the Germans. They are so far behind the curve. Take a look at where the ECB is compared to the BOE and the Fed, and it's like they haven't yet gotten the call. In fact, um, right now the debate seems to be whether they hike by 25 basis points or 50 basis points, but not at this meeting tomorrow, rather next month, um, and really in a month and a half, because that meeting is at the end of July before the August break. Um, the one thing that they could do at this meeting, which um, Christine Lagarde signaled in a blog post um, earlier uh, about a month ago, is start to unwind their balance sheet. This uh, ECB balance sheet towers over everybody else's. I mean, 8.8 .8 trillion euros, it's bigger than the Fed's, and they still haven't started to unwind yet. Even as we've seen rates jump. Um, in fact, if you look at Bunds, the gains that we've seen this quarter are going to be the biggest quarter uh, we've seen in a century, or this century, I should say, not in the last 100 years. But it's pretty amazing, um, the picture there. So I think everyone's going to be glued to this meeting tomorrow. Matt, this was nice. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yes. Looking yeah. ahead to the ECB. We should do that again. Matt Miller, thank you, buddy. It's good to hear from you. Matt Miller on Bloomberg Radio with Paul Sweeney in around about 10 minutes' time. David Stubbs back with us from JP Morgan Private Bank. David. 
we haven't seen this since 2011. We've had negative rates since 2014. Your point, your view on the big change that's come in from this ECB. You're right, John. Absolutely historic stuff coming soon. And I think that there is an understandable desire to rapidly get away from negative rates. No one wanted to get into negative rates initially. It's uh, this kind of crazy situation to be in if you're a central banker. And so I would expect them to get away from that fairly soon, probably probably 25 basis point hikes. I don't see a 50 there, but I think that is baked in the cake getting back to zero. I think there's a couple of things though, which make us a little skeptical that what's priced into the market, i.e. their policy rate, you're know, getting close to 1% in, uh, you know, in the next few quarters is getting a little ahead of itself for a couple of reasons. Firstly, this central bank has a terrible record of hiking just at the wrong time. They hiked in 2008, just before the financial crisis. They hiked in 2011, just before the, the, uh, the European banking crisis. They know that. They don't want to do it again. And then, of course, we still have, despite some very significant improvement in balance sheets and internal structural arrangements, some weaknesses in the Eurozone. Obviously, the periphery. Look at the spread between the Italian debt and the Bund. It's risen significantly in the last few months and quarters. The ECB is aware that they can't push the, the Eurozone uh, as hard as other monetary areas because it's not like mon other monetary areas. And so I think those, uh, those two considerations are going to still leave an institution, as Matt pointed out, incredibly cautious, uh, happy to be behind the curve, happy to see evidence of, you know, of inflation pressures building domestically and still moving uh, you know, methodically in the next few months. The Italian bond market, the one to worry about, you mentioned it, David. And of course, the Federal Reserve doesn't have to worry about that. And the Federal Reserve gets to look at a much more resilient labour market too. I'm looking at yield time now by 11 basis points at close to 340 on an Italian 10-year. Let's finish here, David. Do you think it's going to be difficult for this ECB to get much above zero on the depot rate? Do you think that's going to be a challenge in and of itself? We see them hiking a, a couple of times ab above zero, so 0 0.25, 0 0.50 into, ne into next year for sure. But then the, uh, the outlook is so uncertain because of the energy issues. How big a hit is this going to be? Is this going, are we going to see the Eurozone on the verge of a recession as we move into next year? Are we going to have rationing of energy and shortages and rolling blackouts as some people are, are talking about, uh, John? So I, I do think that they, they are mandated to focus on inflation. Remember, they don't have a dual mandate, unlike the Fed. They are solely focused on keeping inflation uh, you know, close to their 2% target and, and a bit below it. Uh, they have the core inflation there that is way too high. They need that to stabilize and start to come down. We think that's going to play out over the next six to nine months. So we see them getting a bit above zero, but maybe not as high as the market is currently suggesting. They do have this kind of shadow mandate, though, don't they? This unofficial mandate, if you will, and that stability in the peripheral bond market. David, Matt mentioned unwinding the balance sheet. How are they going to do that? So, uh, John, I think it's really interesting uh, in this uh, coming press conference tomorrow and in the next few months, if they try to lay out a stability-focused bond-buying mechanism, i.e. something that is out there with clear criteria, probably quite uh, exacting criteria, for them to restart the bond buying that they're just, that they're just about to stop, but, to do, but one that's focused on stability uh, only and not on the inflation mandate. Remember, the, the buying of the, of the bonds so far has been tied up with the overall macroeconomic goals. But you're right, the instability of the periphery will continue to stalk this central bank. And that is, I think, going to put a cap on what they can do on the, on the deposit rate. I think it's something that they can and will and should address directly in, the, in uh, some kind of facility set up to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to trigger further bond buying of the periphery if they see a genuine domestic reason to do so. I think that's the incredibly tough balancing act this central bank has to, has to, uh, has to pull off in yep. a way that almost no other central bank has to. David Stubbs of JP Morgan Private Bank. David, good to catch up, mate. As always, up next, your trading diary from New York. This is Bloomberg. Six minutes into the session, a raise in losses, basically unchanged now on the S&P. A busy week ahead. Let's get to your trading diary. Secretary Yellen, repeat, volume two on Capitol Hill at the top of the hour. President Biden leaving for LA to attend the Summit of the Americas at 11.45. An ECB rate decision and President Lagarde news conference coming up tomorrow. And we get another round of jobless claims too. Then finally, the main event, US CPI.
coming up on Friday. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.